Welcome back, friends. We are in the center of the board here in War for Throne 2, which might seem like an odd place to be, but today it's going to be the perfect place because we're talking all about the opening and the opening theory in War for Throne, uh, where the action happens on the outside of the board instead of towards the center. So over on the side, I have uh, I'm showing a thread that I'm going to, that I've written and am going to post to my blog on chess.com. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. You can also find it from my profile on chess.com. Um, and this is all about the opening theory and uh, the different openings that you can play and the different evaluations for those openings uh, when you're in War for Throne 2. Why is it so important to know this theory? Well, let's look at an example uh, of an opening gone wrong. Um, here, red makes a sensible move, uh, seemingly a sensible move to start, um, but one move later, we've got big problems. Uh, you've got a dual attack from blue-green, and you're thinking, okay, do I capture blue and maybe give green the opportunity to give a check? Do I capture green and have blue maybe get one step closer to the back rank? Uh, this is not good if you are playing as red. Um, so in these openings I'm going to show you, red must capture on move one. If red captures blue, we have a series of openings that uh, will lead from that line. If red captures green, likewise, we have um, some openings leading from that line. But uh, a move like this is nonsense. A move like this, even less, uh, less sensical. Um, so the uh, idea here, or the openings that I'm going to be presenting, stem from three basic principles. Uh, I'm going to show you what those principles are, and I'm going to talk about them. I call them the axioms of opening theory for War for Throne. But before I do that, I want to explain where they come from. Um, it's pretty much logic and common sense when it comes to playing chess. Things like if a piece is captured, it's good to recapture. Things like... Um, if there's an undefended piece, you should take it. Uh, common sense things. It also comes from uh, experience. I have a ton of experience playing this game. I've tested out a lot of these openings. and I've tested out how things can go wrong if you don't follow those openings. And then the last important piece to this puzzle is uh, what I call opposite cooperation theory. And it's um, something that's been around in four-player chess since the inception of the game. Uh, and it's not something that I'm making up. Uh, it's the idea that red and yellow are kind of natural um, pseudo teammates, uh, especially in the opening. Same thing for red, or sorry, for green blue. Um, like I said, not everyone follows that principle, uh, but the players who are strongest in standard four player chess or in variant play will understand that even though it's free for all, um, when you are working together with the player opposite you, uh, you can be more effective in your attacks and be more um, able to sustain attacks later on, so better in, in defense. Okay, so with that said, let's present the three axioms of opening theory. I'm going to scroll down my article here, and I'm also going to put them up on the screen. Um, firstly, most important, these are in order of importance, the first one is that when you are under attack from more than one opponent, you must either capture one of them or retreat to safety. Sounds pretty common sense when I say it out loud, um, but something like this move is in direct violation of that axiom in the opening. Why? Well, on move number one, when red is deciding the first move of the game, red is actually facing a dual attack from blue and green. Uh, when you are under attack from more than one opponent, here and here, you must capture one of them or retreat to safety. Obviously, there's no way to re retreat these pawns, so what you need to do is capture one of them. Um, I will show later on which is better, uh, but in the opening prep here, um, capturing blue is probably equally uh, effective as capturing green. Okay. Um, if you have the choice between those two, this is 1C. If you have the choice between those two, uh, you must protect your back rank first. So if blue is already on this square or maybe even this square threatening your back rank, that's the piece that you want to take. Um, if that's not happening uh, and green is here getting ready to give a check, uh, that's the piece that you should take. If both of those aren't threats from you, 
um, then you just want to go for the highest point value. That's axiom number one. Axiom number two is the same thing, but it deals with your opponent. If your opponent is under attack from more than one, sorry, if your opposite is under attack from more than one player without the chance to deal with both of those threats, you must intervene. You must attack one of your uh, adjacent players. So let's look at something like this. Uh, these are nonsense moves really, but if uh, we're faced with this situation where green has attacked yellow and it's our turn to move, um, we are in a position here where we must intervene. If red gets attacked, that puts, if, if yellow gets attacked, that puts yellow at a disadvantage for the rest of the game. And it also means that red is uh, less able to defend attacks from blue-green. So in this, uh, you can either deal with that threat directly by capturing blue. If blue has to recapture there, it's less likely that blue will, or it's, it's downright idiotic for blue to capture yellow there. Blue would almost be forced to recapture. Um, then yellow can deal with this threat properly. Uh, the indirect way of dealing with the threat is to attack green. Blue can still attack here, but now yellow uh, would be smart to recapture blue, knowing that green has a threat to deal with at the same time. Um, so there's a chance that green will um, allow this king to remain here for another turn, in which case uh, yellow will get a chance to recapture later on. That's axiom number two. Axiom number three says undefended pieces must always be protected if they're your own, captured if they're your opponent's. Uh, if you have a choice between the two of them, it doesn't matter which one you choose. There is a narrow situation where it does matter. Um, I'll show what that looks like. Uh, let's say, um, yeah, let's say we make uh, some more nonsense moves and we get hit with a double attack from blue-green, which is the piece that we want to capture here. Um, the forced move, well, I'll say it's forced. But the, the smartest move here is to capture green. Why is that? Again, we look over to blue. We look to the player on our left that says, if the opponent to your left is also compelled to follow axiom 3A or 3B, choose the action against the player to your right. So red to move, he's considering, do we capture blue? Do we capture green? If we look to the player on your left and notice that blue is also compelled uh, to make a choice between this king or recapturing yellow, um, then we're going to let blue make that decision and we're going to capture green. Why is that good? Um, well, we already looked at it. There's a chance that blue will leave this king here, go after yellow, and give um, red a chance to recapture on the next move. Okay, so with those uh, axioms in place, believe it or not, there are only eight openings um, that can be played. In the entirety of, of War for Throne 2, there are eight solid openings. Um, of course, there are almost infinitely many variations on how the openings to be played, but a lot of those don't make sense, and um, a lot of them are things that will mean that you aren't going to earn first place um, right from move number one. If you go wrong here uh, and you aren't playing out the openings according to these three axioms or following the, the named openings that I'm going to present uh, next, uh, you are at a huge disadvantage. Okay, uh, let's scroll down and look at the first named opening. On my article here, as you can see, I have the, the name of the opening, I have an animation showing how it plays out, and I'm also giving the uh, notation for um, what moves are played in the opening. This is also helpful because it shows not only the move, but it shows which one of those three axioms is being used to um, tell the player to play that move. So I'll, I'll show how that works in the first example here. We're looking at the military opening. In the military opening, we have red capturing blue from the start. Blue has a recapture. Yellow captures blue, then green captures red. From here, we have a forced recapture and a forced recapture, and that's it. That's the opening. Uh, I'm With my definition of opening, I'm saying that whenever a player has a turn and they aren't facing a decision between one of those three axioms, that we're done with the opening. So now, 
after blue recaptures, it's yellow to move, and yellow isn't facing a dual attack. He's not dealing with act team number one. There's no way that blue could attack and green could attack simultaneously. Uh, red's opposite is, or, sorry, yellow's opposite is red, and red isn't facing an attack from blue-green. And then thirdly, there aren't any undefended pieces. So uh, with this recapture, the opening is done. How you wanna play from then on is your business, but in this video, we're just talking about the openings. Um, so let's go through the military opening once again. Red captures blue, blue recaptures, yellow captures blue, green captures red, recapture, and recapture. And we're done with the opening. Um, I know the question on everyone's mind right now is, is that a good opening? Um, I'm going to show you the openings first, then in the second half of this video, I'm going to compare and evaluate um, how each player does in each of these openings and which decisions you can make to steer the opening in a direction that's uh, favorable for you, depending on what color you're playing. Okay, next opening on the books is the Autumn opening. Um, with this opening, we still see this same series of moves where we have red captures blue, blue recaptures, yellow captures red. However, in this, uh, in the autumn opening, green will capture yellow instead of uh, capturing red. At this point, um, there are two moves for red. Um, sorry, there are three moves. We're going to look at red captures green in a little bit. But the two moves I want to discuss here are uh, red promoting this. Um, obviously, that's good. Um, if we look at axiom number two, uh, your opposite is being attacked by two players. So red to move here. We're not out of the opening because um, blue can attack yellow there. Green is attacking yellow here. Uh, so by axiom two, we need to intervene as red. So promoting here will threaten this pawn uh, and give blue uh, a decision to make between capturing yellow or capturing red. It's kind of that direct method of interfering with this dual attack against um, yellow. So this was the move that I played for a long time. I see a lot of beginners playing this move. However, I think this move is uh, much better. Um, it accomplishes the same thing. You're still attacking this pawn this undefended pawn of blues. Uh, but when blue captures, either en passant or capturing just directly, um, if you have promoted here, you're giving blue three points for the capture versus if you've only gone one step to d3, um, you are only giving blue one point for the capture. So my preference now and in this opening is to uh, play d3 instead of uh, d4 with uh, promotion to a king. So um, in this situation now, blue to move, um, I talked about blue having a choice here. It's not a choice. Um, per axiom number one A, sorry, the, the third part of three, um, blue can decide to capture yellow or capture red. Um, but if blue looks over to the player on his left, that's yellow, he sees that yellow is also facing a similar decision. Yellow has an undefended piece here, which he can retreat, or he can take the point uh, value from green. So in that case, it's always uh, the best move to take the action against the player to your right. So in this case, blue will capture that pawn, regardless of whether we promote it or not, blue will capture this. Um, and then yellow has the choice here. Um, yellow will retreat, green will retreat, and red will recapture. That's the autumn opening. One more time through the autumn opening, we see uh, red and blue trading real quick. Yellow captures blue, green captures yellow. D3, that key move where we step up once with the pawn, blue will capture. Uh, yellow retreats, green retreats, and red recaptures. Okay, the next opening on the book is called the delayed pinwheel opening, and it starts off uh, like the military opening, like the autumn opening, we see red and blue exchanging material, yellow captures, and then green and, uh, well, green captures yellow, just like in the autumn opening, and now red will capture green. Again, yellow's facing a dual threat, so red must intervene. In this case, uh, red will capture green. Um, and then from there, we get these 
kind of pinwheel recaptures where blue recaptures yellow, yellow recaptures green, green recaptures red. Let's look at that one more time. The reason it's a delayed pinwheel is because it starts off with this trade of material and then we get around the board three series of captures and then back around with three recaptures. All right. Let's move on now. Uh, the next one is the beginner's left opening. This one is one that's very, uh, very solid if you are just learning these axioms. Um, red and yellow here trade off material. And after those four moves, we're done with the opening. The reason it's called beginners uh, is because um, when, well, you have a capture, recapture, and then yellow has the choice. Um, it might be lead to some complicated lines to capture blue. So by capturing green, we get a simple recapture and we're out of the opening quickly. Yellow doesn't have to do any messy calculation. Um, and uh, the left comes from the fact that red and yellow are both capturing to the left. So that's the beginner's opening. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, I see it a lot with uh, newer players who are just learning the, the ideas behind these openings. The pinwheel opening. We looked at the delayed pinwheel where we start off with this trade of material just a couple seconds ago. In the pinwheel opening, this is the first one where red captures green, we get those three uh, anti-clockwise captures uh, right from the beginning. And then from there we get our three recaptures and we're done with the opening. So kind of, uh, kind of a fun one. One, two, three captures and then one, two, three recaptures and that's the opening done. All right, next opening is one that I played a lot at the beginning. It's a good opening for teams. Um, when I was playing War for Throne uh, early on, a lot of it was teams play, and this opening was shown to me. Um, I call it the Grable opening. When you capture green, blue captures, and then yellow captures green. Um, this opening in teams, if red and yellow can communicate freely and um, figure out that they want to start by attacking green. This opening can be very intimidating for green. We're going to look later on and show that green actually has a lot of compensation for this double attack. And if green plays this well, um, he's actually going to be very advantaged out of the Grable opening. So green to move here. Um, is this a choice? I say no. I, th I say that capturing yellow is forced. Um, you know, you have two options here. Red isn't threatening your back rank. Yellow's threatening a check, first of all. But secondly, green looks at the player on his left, that's red, and notices that red has uh, other problems to deal with. So green captures yellow. Um, and in the Grable opening, you step back, blue steps back. Capturing here, not great, because red will just recapture. You're giving up three points for one. So blue steps back and rescues uh, the king. Uh, I should also mention that blue stepping back this way, not great because uh, then he's attacked by yellow here um, and green is kind of helpless to intervene. Uh, blue will get double attacked and this king is um, reds for the taking. So uh, in the Grable opening, after red retreats, blue does the same. Let's look at that one more time. We get this double attack on green. Of course, blue's capturing uh, red as well. We get the double attack on green and green recaptures forced against yellow. Red retreats, blue retreats. Okay, uh, so the next one on the list I call the greedy grable opening. This is uh, a lot of the same stuff. It starts off the same way, but in this case, um, instead of rescuing this king, red is going to be greedy and take the three point king uh, from blue. We're going to give this up in favor of gaining points from blue, keeping things moving. So it plays out capture and a capture recapture there. Why does blue have to capture? Well, yellow could attack green, so red must intervene. Sorry, blue must intervene. Um, and then green gets a recapture there. Um, this is now my preferred opening. If we look at the evaluations later, and after I did this analysis, uh, it was kind of revealed to me that capturing blue here on this move for red to make this capture is a lot better. Um, you get kind of some momentum and some initiative uh, where now blue has a forced, uh, forced move against yellow. Um, and you know you don't want to take the time to rescue this king in the opening. You want to 
accelerate out of the gates and keep things going, um, keep things at a, at a speedy pace. So we, cap we recapture there. Blue then has a forced capture on yellow um, by axiom number two. Yellow recaptures and green recaptures. And then we have one left to go. That's it. This one and that's all eight of them. Uh, so the beginner's right is a series of captures and recaptures uh, from the beginning. Red captures green in this opening, blue captures yellow, yellow has a recapture, green has a recapture. So much like the beginner's left opening, again that was capture, recapture, capture, recapture, the beginner's right opening is capture, capture, recapture, recapture. Uh, simple and, um, you know, kind of plays out well for all four players, not anything that anyone has to memorize or think too critically about. Okay, so uh, with that done, I want to move on. I'm gonna skip the evaluations, we'll come back to that. I know that's a big, big question that everyone's probably wondering right now. I wanna show this. This is my masterpiece, <laughs> my decision tree about um, which lines, which moves lead to which openings for those specific players. Uh, for right now, ignore the numbers below. I'll talk about what those numbers indicate later on. Right now though, I just wanna show, so on move one, red has the choice between capturing blue, so that's D takes C4 uh, with the promotion, or red can capture green. That's K takes L11, um, capturing green there. So by following these kind of branches and decisions, uh, you can see which moves are forced, which moves are uh, leading to which openings, and later on we'll look at the numbers and how we can see player's strength by uh, each decision that they face. So uh, for instance, let's let's pick the greedy grable opening here. So that starts with red takes green. Uh, from there, blue has a choice. Blue can uh, capture on d3 or he can capture on d12. Uh, for the greedy grable, blue will capture, sorry, blue will capture red. Uh, and then again, we have a branch where yellow has a choice to take um, blue or to take green. We are going to have uh, yellow taking L11 against um, green. And then green, it says here, is a forced recapture on yellow. That's what I talked about earlier where it looks like green has a choice, but the much smarter option is just to take this because now red has to deal with a threat. And then of course we're down here down here where it forks one last time. The grable opening is where red will retreat the king. And the greedy grable opening is where red captures on d3. So that's how to navigate this tree. <clears throat> and then again, all the openings are labeled down here to show what opening uh, was decided by these series of moves. Okay, uh, next up, here is my analysis or the evaluation um, for each of these openings. In the opening, um, what I've noticed is that you shouldn't play with regard to point value. Yes, we know that pawns are worth one point, kings are worth three points, um, but if you play what I call naively, if you're playing in the interests of only making decisions that benefit you point-wise, um, you're going to end up losing more points than you gain. For instance, on move one, uh, this looks like a terrible idea because you're giving up three points for um, blue getting uh, one, or blue giving you one point in return. Um, so if you're playing naively, you would never make this capture, you would never make this capture because you're giving up more points than you're gaining. Um, but we already looked at why that's a bad idea. The other thing to consider is that um, all of these pieces, all the pawns will be future kings on the board. Um, if you can take this pawn off the board, yes, right now it's only worth one point, but later on that's a king that blue doesn't get to promote. So think about it that way. Um, in the opening, I'm going to be using an average value of two points per piece. doesn't matter if that piece is a king or a pawn. I'm going to say that each point is worth or each piece is worth two points. 
Um, and I, what I found is that using that value tends to be about average and it uh, shows, um, really allows us to, to get a true measure of uh, player strength in the opening. Okay, so um, on this chart, I'm showing uh, the points gained per piece lost. So for all of these openings, if for instance, let's look at the, uh, the pinwheel opening, that's this, this row on the, on the chart there. Um, in the pinwheel opening, we see uh, these moves play out. And for instance, red has lost two pieces. He's given up uh, his pawn over here and he's given up his pawn over here. He's gained four points for it. So four points divided by two pieces is two points per piece which again is what I'm calling average, which is why we see plus 0.0, .0 for red in the pinwheel opening. Uh, same thing for blue. Yellow now, if we look, has uh, given up one piece and only gained one point for it. So that's one point per piece, which is one full point less than the average of two points per piece. Green, by contrast, has given up one piece and has gained three points for it. So that's three point per piece which is one more than the average. So that's kind of my first level analysis of, of these openings. You can look and see, for instance, out of all the eight choices for red, um, you have plus zero, plus zero, minus one, minus one, plus zero, minus one, plus zero, minus one, and minus 0.5. Uh, if you're paying attention, you'll notice that none of these openings are particularly great for red. There are some openings uh, like the autumn opening, the military opening, or the greedy grable, where red does all right, he does about average, um, but most of the time red is losing losing points in the opening uh, compared to the average. Uh, in fact, his average is minus 0.5. Blue has an average of just you know a, a small a small advantage, more than two points per piece. Yellow does about the same as red, and green actually in all of these openings does the best. Green actually has about a half a point advantage um, when it comes to two points per piece. Okay, so I was looking at this evaluation and, and thinking, okay, well, this kind of gives me a, a, a small picture, but surely there's gotta be a way to compare how you've done in the opening with the other three players. Um, if you're red and you're trying to decide between going for uh, the military opening or the autumn opening, um, you might evaluate those the same based on this chart is zero and zero. But if you look at the other three players, okay, yellow uh, has minus one in either case, so not great for yellow. But if there was a difference between yellow having zero or having minus one, you'd probably want to give yellow an advantage. Um, if yellow is stronger, you'll be stronger. The other thing to consider is that if blue and green are doing well, um, that's a, a disadvantage for you. So if you look at those two openings, here blue has plus one, green has minus one. Here uh, blue is down about two thirds of a point and green is up by one full point. Um, if you average those out, the military opening is better, uh, even though in the evaluation series shows plus 0, 0.0 for red in either case. Um, so what I've also done is inserted another chart later on that takes that into account. Uh, the formula that I'm using here is that your point per piece value, so this value, I'm taking the average of red and yellow, and I'm subtracting the average of blue-green. Although with red and yellow, um, for the numbers, uh, for red's evaluation, the numbers here are weighted two to one in favor of red. Obviously, you are somewhat concerned with the strength of your opposite, um, but not as much as your own strength. So for that reason, I'm doing two thirds uh, from red's strength, one third from yellow strength and combining those and then subtracting the average value from blue green. I'm saying each of those are equally uh, a disadvantage to you if blue or green are stronger. So that's uh, this chart that I'm giving here, um, which shows I think a bigger, a better picture of um, the relative strength of each team. Yes, it's good to, gain, to, to shoot for two points per piece, but um, you also have to consider the other three players on the board. So um, 
if we're looking at this, it has a much clearer picture now that red does not do great in the opening. Uh, this opening, the Greedy Grable, is the only one now where red uh, has uh, has as close to an advantage as, as he can get. Every other opening, the beginner's left is terrible for red. Let's look at that up top. The beginner's left, minus one, it looks like it's the same as like the delayed pinwheel or the Grable opening, but in the beginner's left, look at blue-green. Blue-green are each up by a full point. Yellow is down by a full point. All of that is bad news for red. And for that reason, the beginner's left here shows the strongest disadvantage for red. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but let's just look at the averages. Uh, now red is down by relatively close to a full point. Uh, blue is up by three quarters of a point. Yellow is down by half a point and green is almost up by a full point um, against the other three players. So um, yes, there is some imbalance, but um, the other thing to consider is that the player doesn't always get to choose the opening. For instance, uh, let's look back at our decision tree. If red goes for um, capturing green, sorry, if red starts by capturing blue, blue doesn't have a choice in the opening. That's forced, yellow has a choice now, yellow can capture blue. Um, if we're going for the delayed pinwheel maybe, um, and through this entire opening, blue didn't have a choice of what moves to play. Everything that blue played was forced. Um, and then when we go to the delayed pinwheel, now blue is sitting at a, an advantage even though he didn't get to choose that. So um, the, the consideration here for each player is to think about, okay, when it's your move, um, which decision you make influences the possible choices for that decision tree. So um, going back to this and showing about the numbers, um, what I've done is taken the average from all the possibilities stemming from each of these decisions. So for instance, red capturing blue on move one has an average evaluation of 1.0. Obviously this can lead to one of four possible openings, military, autumn, delayed pinwheel, or beginner's left. Then from each of those four, I've taken the average uh, evaluation for red. So red in military, minus 0.33, autumn, minus 0.5, delayed pinwheel, not good, beginner's left, super not good. If you take the average of all of those, it's minus 1.0, uh, for red that is, since red is the one getting to make this decision, red has an average evaluation of minus one. Um, but if red captures green, instead, if we look back here, red captures green, that's a slightly less worse, um, uh, outcome on average for red. So um, let's kind of look through the, this decision tree and make the decisions as if those players are making the decisions and see what see what happens. So red will capture green to start because red would much rather have um, one of the openings stemming from capturing green than all of the bad uh, outcomes that come from capturing blue. Red captures blue. Now blue has a decision. Blue can capture red or blue can capture yellow. If we look at uh, blue capturing on D3, that's red, um, that's actually an average of, or an average advantage for blue. If we go to the pinwheel opening, the grable opening, or the greedy grable opening, uh, those are all good options for blue. If you look at uh, blue capturing yellow instead, um, that leads to the beginner's right where the evaluation for blue is minus point three. So now blue has a chance to move. Blue will capture red. Again, a better option. And then yellow again has this, has this choice. Do we go with the pinwheel? No, because it's terrible. Um, mostly for red, it's terrible, but yellow will instead go for capturing green because it's a, it's more of an advantage for yellow to end up in the grable opening or the greedy grable opening force recapture there. Um, and then here's where I was talking about the decision that I uh, made in terms of the Grable versus the Greedy Grable opening. If you look at the Grable opening, not great for red, minus more than a full point. If you look at the Greedy Grable, that's where red gets an average of two points per piece. 
Um, yellow does all, all right in that opening. So that's why red capturing here is a good move. And we see the rest of the opening play out for the greedy grable. So that's my evaluation. Um, there's not too much more to say uh, about all these. Um, the one thing that I'll close out the video with is uh, things that I've discussed um, in the bottom half of this uh, article, which is saying, um, you know, nobody's perfect when you're playing in the opening. You can't assume that your opponents will always follow the same three axioms of, of good play and good theory, and they're not going to follow the same lines that you want them to follow. Um, in those cases, it's best, in my experience, I don't have data or metrics on this, but in my experience, keep following those same axioms. You know, if, if yellow makes a blunder, if you're playing as red and yellow makes a blunder or isn't following, isn't cooperating with you, that's okay. Um, you'll still do well to follow those three axioms of play. Um, that's not to say that you'll win the game or you'll come out in second place, um, but in most cases, uh, good things usually happen, bad things sometimes happen. The game of four-player chess is not 100% predictable. You can't always know what the other players are going to do, and uh, you can't always prevent uh, a disastrous result. So if you follow the, the, the axioms here, if you're playing well, uh, most of the time it will work out well for you, um, but sometimes it won't. So be prepared for that, and uh, you know, don't blame yourself. Don't blame, don't blame my axioms if, if things go wrong for you. Um, sometimes it just happens that way. And I just wanted to add one final note here. Uh, of course, thanks for watching, but if you do have questions about any of the openings, any of the opening theory, um, leave it in the comments on YouTube, leave it on the, on the comments of the blog post on chess.com, send me a friend request, send me some, some messages, I'd be happy to address those questions and talk uh, at length about um, any, any of the ideas going on in the opening here. So. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.